I'd have thought by now God you would have reached down And wiped our tears away Stepped in and saved the day But once again I say amen And it's still raining But as the thunder rolls I barely hear you whisper through the rain I'm with you And as your mercy falls I raise my hands And praise the God who gives And takes away And I will praise you in this storm And I will lift my hands For you are who you are No matter where I am Every tear I've cried You hold you never left my side And though my heart is torn I will praise you in this storm I remember when I stumbled in the wind You heard my cry You, you raised me up again well, My strength is almost gone how can I carry home if I can't find you? But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I will praise you in this storm. And I will lift my hands, for you are who you are. No matter where I am, every tear I've cried, you hold in your hands, and you never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. I lift my to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the Lord maker of heaven and earth I lift my eyes into the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth And I will praise you in this storm And I will lift my hands For you are who you are No matter where I am Every tear I've cried You hold in your hands You never left my side And though my heart is torn I will praise you in this storm And though my heart is torn I will praise you in this storm Praise God Have you ever been in a storm in your life? Did he ever not show up? He'll never leave us or forsake us. That was good, wasn't it? <laughs> Children's church. Almost forgot. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. If you was here Wednesday, we went over the... The armor of God, and we went pretty deep with it, and I felt like we had a good service, and I had all intentions on going in deep into this verse tonight, but 
thank God that we don't rely on Zeke Step. We rely on Jesus Christ. And this is what he wants us to, to go over today. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Is everyone there? Those who are able, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, God, we come before you today, God, in need of your word, in need of you, God. God, we understand through your word that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but there is a supernatural power out there that is that is trying to take our light and trying to take our joy and, and trying to keep the lost lost and prevent your light, your son, Jesus Christ, from being seen through us, God. God, we know that we must inject your word into our hearts every Every day we must feed your spirit on the inside of us every day so that we can be that light. God, I ask you right now to feed us. God, push Zeke's step to the side and let every word that's said this morning, let it be of you, for it's your word that we need, God. Edify your church today. Strengthen us. Make us what you have called us to be, God. And if there's any lost in here, I ask you to send the penetrating power of your Holy Spirit into their heart and pierce their heart and convict them and let them understand that they have no hope other than Jesus Christ. And God will give you all the praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I had all intentions on uh, studying this verse tonight and going into death and we probably still will because we're not going to go real deep into principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness, but we are going to talk a little bit about them today. And one thing I want you to understand, uh, as I was studying, does, does everybody know what a principality is? Do you know what a prince is? Prince is a ruler of a small state or, a, or an area. Well, that principality is that area that he rules over. So through this verse, we understand that that our adversary, the devil, has put princes over areas of this world that they control. How many believes that Satan is the god of this world, isn't he? He's the prince of this world. He can manipulate your flesh. He can't do anything to your spirit, for that's Christ in you. But he controls your flesh. Before you, before you were born again and were saved, he had control of you. He owned you. You was going to go to hell with him. You was going to be where he is. But now that we've accepted Christ, now we can be where Christ is. Only through faith in Jesus Christ was his grace, was God's grace shed upon us. But these principalities are real. The threat is very real. And we as Christians are in spiritual warfare. Now how successful would an army be if they didn't understand their enemy? Wouldn't be very successful, would they? Before an, enemy, before an army attacks their enemy, they learn about them. Well, today we're going to learn about these powers and principalities. And we're going to start by talking about a little spiritual battle that Elijah was in. How many likes reading about Elijah? One of the greatest prophets ever wrote about in the Word of God. Well, it started as uh, Elijah, he had came to Ahab and told him, I think this was in 1 Kings chapter 17, said a drought's coming. Said God said a drought is coming. Well, three years later, and there was a lot happened between then, but three years later, God tells Elijah to go back and seek out Ahab and tell him that I'm going to send rain upon the earth. Do you guys remember reading about this? So Elijah, he's on his way, and he runs into Obadiah. Now, during those three years of drought, Ahab's wife Jezebel, we all have heard of her, she had all the prophets of God killed, slayed them, except for the ones that Obadiah had hid. I think there were 50. He had hid them in caves and was feeding them, trying to keep them alive. Well, Elijah runs into Obadiah. 
And he says, hey, he said, I want you to go get your master. I want you to go get the king of Israel, Ahab, and tell him that I'm here. And tell him I want to see him. So Obadiah says, said, buddy, the king has been looking for you for three years and can't find you. He's looked everywhere. And now if I go to him and tell him that you're here, God's going to hide you somewhere in a place and he's not going to be able to find you and he's going to kill me. And Elijah promised, said, by the God in heaven, I'll be there to see Elijah, or be there to see Ahab. I ain't going to run. I ain't going to hide. God's not going to hide me. I'm going to be there. I'm going to talk to Ahab. So Obadiah did what Elijah said. And when Ahab come to him, he said, Are you the one that troubles Israel? Are you the one that troubles Israel? And, and uh, Elijah said, No, you and your father's house are the one that's troubled Israel because you've went back from what God said. You've left his commandments. You've done evil in the sight of God. You're the one that has troubled Israel. Now I want you to think about the church. How many times does the world look at the church and blame them for troubling our world? How many times do we get to blame for the bad things in this world? Does that not happen? You remember when it was prophesied that the good things would, uh, people would think they were bad and the evil things people would think for good? Well, that's happening this day and time. And the church is being attacked by the world. Well, the church has to understand to counter this that this is a spiritual battle. How many people believe that we're in a spiritual battle? We're in a very real spiritual battle. We're in a high threat situation. So Elijah tells Ahab, he said, I want you to gather all the prophets of Baal. There's 450 of them. And the prophets of the groves, there's 400 of them. Get them all together. Get them all together. And Elijah gathered the people and said, if the Lord is God, then follow him. And if Baal is, then follow him. And you know what the people said? Nothing. Nothing. That's what's going on in church today. The church is preaching and teaching Jesus Christ and the world is looking at them dumbfounded. They're staring at them looking. We're preaching and teaching it, but no, there's no action. There's no action. There's nothing for the people to see for them to believe. We'll learn later here in a minute where Elijah proved that God was real. But when we studied Wednesday night talking about having your loins girded about with truth, does the church have their loins girded? Girded about with truth. The word, uh, the words uh, girded about means ready for action. How many in the church is ready for action against this spiritual warfare? Is the church itself, are they taking action? Have they girded their, their loins up with truth and ready for action? We learned Wednesday night that your loins is from the bottom of your ribs to your hips. That's the, the, the weak point of your body. If it's weak, everything else can't function. So it, it's saying to have your loins girded with truth. What is the truth? The truth is that Jesus Christ is the only thing that can save us. Jesus Christ's righteousness is what makes us acceptable to God. So the church has to be girded up and ready for action. So we must be walking the walk, not only talking the talk. So the church is doing what a lot just said. He said, if God be God, then serve him. And the world is looking at us dumbfounded, but they want results. How do we give them results? Well, I just said, go get two bullocks. He said, and I'll let you pick which one you want. He did. He let them go first. So those prophets picked their bullets and he's or, or their bullocks, and he said, cut them into pieces and prepare them on the altar, but put no fire under them. Put no fire on them. And he said, if your God is able, if Baal is able to bring the fire and burn this sacrifice, then he's God. He said, but if my God is able to bring this fire and burn my sacrifice, then he's God. And the people agreed, said, if your God can burn this sacrifice, if the fire from heaven can fall, then the people spoke up and said, well, we'll serve him. 
Well, the world is saying, if you can prove to me that your God is real, if you can prove to me that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, then they'll serve him. The problem with the church is we're talking the talk, but we're not showing them that God is real. How do we show them that God is real? We learn Wednesday night. And this, for those of you that wasn't there, I know some of you have heard this, but it goes into the depth of the, of the armor that we're supposed to have on, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How many believe the gospel of peace is what we need? The gospel of peace is Jesus Christ. He is peace. When we accept him in our hearts and we continue to look to him, we're overwhelmed with that peace that surpasses all understanding. For people to accept Christ, they have to understand that the gospel of peace is true. So when we have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, when we're walking in a manner that God wants us to walk, when we're looking to Christ and we're fulfilling our calling, when our talk is matched up with our walk the way we walk is preparing the ones that don't believe to prepare them to accept the gospel of peace the reason that people ain't accepting the gospel of peace is because our feet ain't shod with the preparation of it means that we're saying one thing and we're doing another we're saying put your faith in Jesus Christ and then the church is fighting against each other and we're not walking the walk so for the for the children of Israel to come back to God, they had to see that God is real. They had to see the fire fall on this sacrifice. How is the world going to be able to see? How is your lost family and your lost loved ones going to be able to see that Jesus is the only way? It's when our feet is shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. When they see Jesus through it, they'll accept him. Not just because we said it, but because we lived it. How many people want to live it? That's the secret to it. So the prophet started crying out to Baal half a day and nothing. And Elijah starts to mock him. How many of you like to have been there when he was mocking him? He said, maybe your God is, is speaking right now. Or, or maybe he's pursuing his enemies. Or maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's on a long journey. Maybe you need to wake him up. He's asleep. So the prophets started cutting themselves till the blood was, was oozing out of him all day and no results. This is where the church is. Remember when I preached not too long ago on self-effort and how God won't bless self-effort? These people were looking to their God and they were offering sacrifice and trying to do something with their own hands to bring the Holy Spirit fire down to, to take this uh, sacrifice and accept it and burn it. But there's no results in there. But what did Elijah do to receive results? First, he repaired the altar of the Lord. What's an altar for? It's for a sacrifice, right? You remember the other day I told you that God don't want our sacrifice. He wants us to look to him. You remember when I read you the verse when I asked Jesus, said, what is it that the, what's the work that we can do to do the work of God? And he said, the work of God is that you believe on him who he sent. So our work, our responsibility and our priority is to believe in Jesus Christ. So when we repair that altar, that means that we are looking to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Once that has been repaired in the church, once we stop cutting ourselves, spiritually speaking, and trying to, to form ourselves into something that we think we need to be, when we repair the altar of the Lord by putting our faith back in Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit fire will come and it will accept that sacrifice because it's not our sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then people will believe. Then Jesus Christ will be lifted up and people will be coming to the altar to be saved. But Elijah repaired the altar and he took 12 stones and built the altar. And we all know what the 12 stones stands for. And he made a trench under it and he put the wood down and he cut the bullock in pieces. You remember what else he did? He told them to fill up four barrels of water. He said, dump it on it. Fill the trench with it. Dump it on the wood. Dump it on the rocks. Dump it on the bullet. He said, do it again. And do it again. 
So they poured what is four times 16? Math magicians in here? Anyway, 64. Well, they put that much water on this. I want you to think about something. What is fire's enemy? Water. What is your spirit's enemy? Your flesh. I'm going to show you what God can do to your flesh when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Even though your flesh is enmity against your spirit, and the Word of God says they're always struggling together. And even though water, Elijah put this on here to show them that God's fire was stronger than the enemy of fire, which is water. God can show you that your flesh can be taken out of the way. How? When we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And they poured this water on the fire. And what happened? Do you guys remember? I'm going to read this to you, and I wrote it down because I didn't want to misquote this. And this is 1 Kings 18 through 36. And this is Elijah's prayer. He said, Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their back again. Then what happened? Oh, man. When we ask God to show himself, when we ask God to work through our lives, when we sacrifice our flesh by putting our faith in, our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, when we get ourselves out of the way and we say, God, you prove yourself and you prove me. I can't prove myself and I can't prove you exist, but he can sure glorify himself. He can take care of himself. He's God and he does it without our help and he can sure glorify you and show the world that you are a servant of Jesus. Christ. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. The water wasn't a problem anymore. The enemy to the fire had been destroyed. Your flesh can be taken out of the equation when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. There may be somebody in here today that's been trying to form their flesh into something acceptable. You've been trying to work and to work and to work and it seemed like the flesh kept holding you back. Let me tell you something. When you shut your eyes and you envision the cross, like I said earlier, and Jesus hanging on it, and you keep your eyes on that, I don't care what your enemy is. There is nothing stronger than Christ in you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The fire came down and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and even the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Your enemy today is your flesh. That's what the adversary has control over. That's what he's king of. That's what these principalities can move you by. But when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, our weakness is made strength through him. Can you say amen? amen. And when the people saw it, when the people saw it, when the world sees you do this, when the world sees you put your faith in him and take it off yourself, what do they do? They'll fall on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. We're too busy looking at and telling them what they should and what they shouldn't do instead of looking at ourselves and asking, are we? do we have our eyes on Christ or are we too busy trying to shape our flesh into something that is acceptable? That's the problem that we have. That's why a lot of people go in and out of church. That's why a lot of people serve God for a while and then they give up. It's because they don't understand how to be victorious over these principalities and these princes that the adversary has set up. But you see, Elijah told them to gather all the prophets of Baal. I want you to think about this for a minute. How many believe killing is bad? Thou shalt not kill. That's a commandment, right? But what does Elijah do here? He told them gather all the prophets of Baal. And when he gathered them up, what did Elijah do to them? He killed every one of them. 
I'm here to tell you today that you got evil prophets sent from these principalities, sent from these princes that are prophesying in your life. And they're in the form of a television. They're in the form of an iPhone. They're in the form of an Xbox. They're in the form of, of any other thing other than Jesus Christ. They're in the form of people's whispering in your ears. They're in the form of this and the form of that. But God's saying to gather them all together and kill them. How do we do that? By putting our faith in Jesus Christ and ignoring everything else. By submitting ourselves to the Word of God. Not submitting ourselves to doing good, but submitting ourselves to the work that is required of us. And that is to believe. Submitting ourselves to reading the Word of God and to study it. And when we do that, we are more than conquerors through Him. We can't kill these things without Jesus Christ because without Jesus Christ, these things own us. If you go to battle with the principality, you'll lose every time. It's like having the whole United States chasing you down. Are you going to win that battle? This is in the spirit realm. These are evil spirits. These are, are rulers and of darkness in high places. What does high places mean? Heavenly places. This is a warfare going on in the cosmic realm, in the spiritual realm that you can't see. How can you overcome a whole state? This is a principality. There's a prince over it. Some people believe they're fallen angels. Some people believe they're demon spirits. I'm not here to debate that. I'm here to tell you that there is a whole state against you, a state of evil power, and it has a ruler over it. How are you going to stand up to that when it comes at you? We'll learn here in a little bit that a whole principality came at Elijah. And we'll see how he handled it and how that directly affects our life. But when the people saw it, they fell on their face and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah killed all the prophets. Now remember when I told you earlier that when you start to become more spiritual and when you start to shine a little brighter, you remember what I told you had happened? You can guarantee that there'll be a counterattack on you. You've got to be ready. We can sit and ignore this stuff all we want, but the reality of it is we're in a spiritual battle. It wouldn't have been put in the Word if it wasn't important for us to understand what our enemy's doing. But Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. How many wants our area, how many wants our community to get back into revival? This place was in a drought for three years. Now remember... He's made the adversary mad. We know that counterattack's coming, but right now revival's here. That makes the devil mad, don't it, when we have revival. But how many wants revival? How many wants to get out of this spiritual drought? How many in here today, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I'll raise mine. I've been in spiritual drought after spiritual drought. I don't want to go back to a spiritual drought. I want Jesus Christ to be revived in me like nothing I've ever felt before. You see this area, now they was going to encounter a revival. Rain was coming. They'd been in a drought for three years. And Elijah told Ahab, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. How many wants to hear that sound in their lives? Then we got to let our light shine. Now I'm going to explain to you what happened next. How many of you think Elijah, man, he's a strong spiritual man, isn't he? He's strong, ain't he? How many believes Elijah was tough? He took on a whole principality. The principality that was given charge over Israel. The evil spirits that hindered Israel. He took them all on by himself because God strengthened him. God told him to. Now after this happened and revival came, Ahab went and told his crazy wife, Jezebel. Anybody got a crazy wife? Never mind. <laughs> We'll preach on that next Wednesday. But Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, So let the gods do to me and more also if I don't kill you like those prophets that you killed. And Elijah, we're right here, it said, and he rose up. So Elijah's sitting here and the messenger comes. He said, Jezebel just threatened you and she's going to kill you by this time tomorrow. The God, her gods is going to do that to her. And he arose. 
Now you think he stuck his chest out and said, all right, I'm ready for round two. Look at all he's been through. Look at everything that God done through him. Every word that he spoke happened. What did Elijah do? Was he ready for round two? No. He got scared. And he ran. All the way to Beersheba in Judah. He's plumb out of Israel now over into Judah running scared. Why'd he do that? Why'd he do that? If you ever won a spiritual battle, and then the next day it feels like you were just so defeated. You ever get your head looking up and say, thank you, Lord, for what you did for me, and then here comes another attack and you couldn't handle it. You remember not too long ago I preached a sermon on the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And you remember I talked about the gap between faith is the times when you ain't got no faith, but God's righteousness was revealed through it all. I guarantee there ain't nobody in here as strong as Elijah was spiritually. You all agree to that? And all of a sudden, Elijah, full of faith, seems like he ain't got none now and he's ran. Well, what happened to him? Well, he ran to Beersheba. So his faith had to have left him, right? So if a principality can run a mighty man, of God like Elijah oh, do you think that you can encounter this spiritual warfare on your own you're going to need Jesus ain't you how many believes you're going to need Jesus Amen. that in itself ought to inspire you to get in this word that in itself ought to inspire you to every day when you wake up say let it all be you today Jesus and nothing of me that in alone, it shouldn't scare you, but it should show you that you need his help. That you can never make it through another battle without him. If Mo mighty Elijah, a spiritual man of God, a prophet that everything he spoke come into existence has tucked his tail and ran. Now I'm not justifying what Elijah did. Everything not done in faith is sin, so he's just sin. That goes to show you that we need him, because if sin is that easy, then we're doomed without a Savior, ain't we? Amen. If you're in here today and you're lost, think about that. I'm going to give an altar call here in a little bit. You're doomed without Jesus Christ. Everything that we do that's not done in faith in Jesus Christ is a sin. You're sinning constantly. We can't escape it. But the threat is real. The threat is powerful. It run a mighty man of God out of Israel into Judah. Let me read Jude 1. Uh, there's only one chapter in it, but verse 9. Write this down if you got a pen. How strong do you think Michael the archangel is? Pretty stout, ain't he? We read about him fighting in many battles, don't we? Let me read you this. It said, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, so he's fighting with the devil right here, he disputed about the body of Moses. This is when Michael and the devil was at odds against each other, and they're fighting over the body of Moses. And this is what Michael did. He said he durst not bring against him a railing accusation. So Michael didn't come up to him. You ever seen people fight and they run up and run their mouth and then somebody walks up and just knocks them slap out? So Michael didn't go up running his mouth. He didn't go up to him with a railing accusation. How did Michael, this great angel, the archangel, how did he overcome the adversary in this battle? Michael said, the Lord rebuked thee. You ever heard somebody come up and say, say to somebody, I rebuked you in the name of Jesus Christ? 